Russ Taff has won multiple Grammy Awards and has been an icon in Christian music for decades, but his life wasn't all accolades and fame. In their book, I Still Believe, Russ and Tori Taff shared their raw struggles of redemption. Russ and Tori, welcome to World Life. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Sydney. We're so honored to have you here and just to be so open about sharing your story. And you have such, you know, a legendary music, a history, um, career in music. We're just so grateful that you both are here. Thank you. So I just want to like dive in, um, hear about your love story. How did God put the two of you together? How did God put the two of us together? Well, I'll, I'll start and then I'll pass the baton. <laughs> um, I was a um, youth minister at this uh, church. It was on a farm and um, I was the youth director and I had two youths, <laughs> two youths. <laughs> It was a small youth group. <laughs> so I was trying to get more people out. And, and, uh, and on the property, they had bunk houses, you know, because it was a summer camp. And uh, a lot of people came. And I had just stopped dating. You know, I, I'm very sensitive. And either I'd get broken up on or I'd break up somebody. And it was just, oh. Uh, uh, but she came walking in. And I lost my appetite for three days. I, it's amazing. I thing? just, and I knew that's, that's the one, but she was dating somebody else at the time, and she's totally out of God's will. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, you can pick it up from there. But you, she was so funny. She made me laugh. And what I remember about our first meeting is that um, he was playing ping pong and doing a very politically incorrect yet funny Chinese accent. And um, I thought <laughs> there could be something there. <laughs> well, ping pong, you know, I, I got it. accent. But we, um, we married very young. We married at, I was 20 and Russ was 22, which now I look around and think, should 20 year olds be driving, much less married? <laughs> and, um, and we moved to Nashville. We were planning on, uh, Russ was working with an evangelist named Jerry Savelle and everything was gearing towards getting married and moving and being in Jerry Savelle's ministry and an offer from a group called the Imperials, which Russ had loved for years. Uh, they offered him a job. So about a month before we were getting married, suddenly everything changes and we're off to Nashville. Yeah. And so you, so you were with, you two have been together for your, like a whole, your whole career have been, you know, your rise to fame. Tell us a little bit about that, how, you know, God was with you two that whole time. Well, it was unexpected in the sense that, that um, it's a guy from Hot Springs, Arkansas, yeah. grew up in Farmersville, California. And suddenly there was um, this momentum that started started with the Imperials, and then it felt very. It's like rapid. the largest crowd I'd ever played for was like 250 people, <laughs> and on my first night with the Imperials, there were 6,000. So I was. It was like, a little different, <laughs> <laughs> and I was. Um, I was back in the day when uh, they didn't have a lot of wives on the buses, but I was young and newlywed and the other. Um, because we didn't have kids, she travels with So I me. could be with them. We took off and everything was new together. All the experiencing, mm -hmm. the, the road experiencing, travel experiencing, the career experiencing, writing songs together. Everything was new and we, we bonded through that, I yeah, think. We did. So it's like, it's, you know, on the outside, it's like we're on top of the world, like God is moving in amazing ways. But then, you know, Russ, that your struggles really came into play with alcoholism. Yeah. G g growing up, uh, my dad was a Pentecostal preacher, but he is also an alcoholic. And so my childhood was spent with uh, one year we would be in church or six months we'd be in church and then he'd relapse. And uh, that would go on for a while. Then he'd try to sober up again. And so we were in and out of churches my whole uh, young life. Um, but what started the whole thing for me, and everybody's got their own story, was growing up with such negative, um, negative sayings that was said to you every day. And after a while, it kind of makes a groove in your brain and you start believing it. But daily, me and my brothers, it was like, you're not worth a bullet to shoot you with. You're not worth the salt that goes on your bread. You'll never amount to anything. And why can't you be more like your cousin? <laughs> <laughs> so daily, I mean, you know, daily, so you, you, you leave your little town and you're, you're in front of thousands of people, but you don't feel worthy. And those voices are constantly, you know, telling you, you're a fake, you're a phony, you know, you don't belong here. Um, 
and no confidence in myself. Uh, and we were in New York, and I'd never drank. We, you know, in Nashville there is some uh, social drinking. I don't, you know, it's between them and God. I, I don't get involved. But uh, I remember the first drink I had. I was 26, and uh, after the first one, about five minutes, I, re I begin to feel those voices get quiet. Those negative voices that they're, I'm going to be found out that I'm a fake. I'm a phony and I don't have the talent to be here. Uh, and so I had another one, and the voices got quieter. And so by the third one, you know, I couldn't hear those voices at all. And I promise, I praise God the next day because I can live this way, you know. I don't feel those, that negative thing about me, and if I can just stay numb, I won't feel it anymore. But not knowing, I was, you know, I had that gene of alcoholism like my dad had, and all my brothers, uh, and it kind of set me up that once I partook, it had, it had me. I mean, it just had me. And for a while, you know, months, you're thinking, this is great. I can live this way. I can walk out on stage, and um, but then it turns on you to where you have to have it, and you hate yourself because you're turning into your dad. Uh, that you're doing the same thing. You know, you're singing for Jesus, and then when times get real bad with all these voices in your head, you'll relapse. Uh, but it, it, it created a struggle that went on for years, just a struggle. And Tori, when did you start noticing that something is not right with my husband, that there's things that he is not opening up and sharing me about? Um, Russ's background, there was a lot of violence in that home. There was a lot of um, negativity, obviously, but there was, there was also a lot of violence in that home. And I knew that. When we got married, I had heard stories, and, and of course, he always put like a funny twist on him at the end. But I was aware that there was, and he was diagnosed with depression um, fairly early into our marriage. And so when I started seeing withdrawal, isolation, um, not wanting to be around people, including me, not wanting. I attributed all of that to depression um, because that had a name and that had been told to us, that had been introduced into our life. Alcoholism from the very beginning, uh, Russ hid mm -hmm. and he hid extremely well. He literally learned at his father's knee how to hide. And so as soon as he started drinking, he started drinking alcoholically in the sense that it was about getting numb as quickly as possible and you, and you hide it. So those characteristics were there from the get-go. But the, the, the whole thing of, uh, you know, we're instructed re to renew our mind and not only with uh, getting sober, but spending time in therapy, spending time uh, at church, spending time meditating scriptures to reprogram this because it was just full of negativity and pain. And it, it was a long, long road. I used to say <clears throat> there were three people in our marriage. There was Russ and Tori and Russ's pain. And um, there was a point in which he, he, he wasn't coming in reeking of alcohol and throwing up on my shoes. So I didn't see, the enemy didn't have a name. It was just, I was losing him um, and I didn't know why. I, I, I saw him spiraling into something that didn't have a name except depression, which is what I thought was going on, which was, that was in there too, but that wasn't the main problem. And I know so many people can connect to your story and your testimony because there's a lot of couples that deal with addiction. What did it do to your marriage itself? You, you know, apart from everything that's going on, you're in the spotlight, you're touring your own shows, you're writing music, but what did it do personally in your marriage? Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, <clears throat> You begin to hate yourself. You know, I, I would try to shave and not even look myself in the mirror because I hated me, that I had become my dad and that the trauma that he caused me, he and mom, I was causing her trauma, creating trauma in her life. Um, but, you know, uh, trying to save our marriage, uh, you know, it's a miracle because I was trying to get away from myself. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be anywhere. I wanted to be away and just stay away. And when you don't like yourself, 
you know, you got a long way to go. But uh, and so the process started with getting sober, uh, you know, marriage counseling and uh, uh, separate counseling. You know, the, but the the scars and the pain of my dad, what he caused, and my mother, um, all of that had to be reprogrammed in my brain. Um, I think some of the hardest part was uh, addiction has to fight to stay alive. And mm -hmm. the main weapon it has <clears throat> is uh, dishonesty. Because if you're hiding and lying and sneaking and, um, and so even if I didn't know what I was dealing with, I knew that this, this man that I had known all of my life, um, I, I couldn't see him in there. And being lied to over a long period of time when you're your eyes are telling you one thing, and the man that you love is telling you one thing, and your gut and your spirit yeah. are telling you something else, mm -hmm. um, is crazy making. Why did you stay? <laughs> I was trying to get away from me. <laughs> and for some reason you stayed. And, and she's the kind that would stick a knife in me. I mean, <laughs> she's not a passive woman. Uh, uh, Come on, there was one night. No, no there, I'm there's, uh, <laughs> never uh, enough. There's a, uh, there's a little bit of New York in her. That, you know, <laughs> she'll cut you. So, uh, go ahead. When did when did you stay? Uh, uh, my goal never was I'm going to stay no matter what. My goal was um, I want to see the man I love whole, and I want to be whole. So, um, because there, addiction it affects at least thirty people in your life. It does. They're exponentially, the circles mm -hmm. get wider and wider. Um, there isn't a quick answer. I think the main reason is that whatever we had when I was 20 and he was 22 was founded on something solid. Um, so I think we had something to go back to. So after all the wreckage and after the, the ashes settled, um, there was something in there that was a a solid foundation, but I will say this, the main reason I stayed is because I watched him do the work. I watched him get up, go to a 12-step meeting, go to therapy, go, go to, to church. church, do what he needed to do, read what he needed to read, and work with me. And didn't, I didn't blame anybody, you know. That that's was, a big That one. was the, the, the big thing for me because that's what my dad did. You know, he blamed everybody for his relapses, uh, but right from the get-go, it was like, I did it, you know, and she would ask me a question, and it was like, yeah, I didn't blame anybody, you know, I didn't blame, blame the door handle when my day was going bad, uh, it was me, it was me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, but to her credit, we've been married 42 years, but she never, she never threw my past up at me when we would get into an argument or we would disagree, where it would be so easy just to throw it out at me and it would silence me, you know. Uh, but she never did. She then began to treat me like an adult as I began to learn to treat myself like an adult and treat her that way too. But um, Shame is at the oh, bottom. Um, shame time. is the cancer underneath addiction and shame comes from trauma and from hiding and from then repeating patterns. And that shame goes so deep that as he was starting to heal and we were starting to heal, it's not because I'm such a wonderful person, though I am. And Mother Teresa, the thing is, I didn't want, there was nothing in me that wanted to pile more shame on someone who was struggling to get free of that. So there wasn't anything in me that said, you know, watch this, I'll make him feel really bad about himself. There, there's no satisfaction in that at all. If I could, could have uh, my prayer come true about my story with, uh, and our story with the DVD and with the book, is that we would begin to trust somebody enough to let them in our lives. My dad tried that and they threw him out several times. And so at a kid, you don't tell anybody what's going on. And, uh, but that, the church can be people can, can be a safe place that because you've got to say it out loud you can't just keep sunday after sunday after sunday holding your you know your your secret and and it's just ripping your heart out and and you're praying god take it away god take it away god take it away uh but but the responsibility lays on you to do the work 
on your knees, you know, in 12 step, whatever, uh, that, that, that to get me through that 24 hours without hurting myself. But if I could encourage people, you know, I, I did it and they didn't throw me out. They could have. And that was the risk I took when we began to tell our story, but that we've got to get well. And I don't know who set the bar so high on Christianity when you first get become a Christian, you know, uh, you know, you got to do all these things if you're going to be a Christian. And I wish they had a kindergarten and a first grade, a second grade, a third grade, that you would learn how to become a Christian. Because in, in a short amount of time, you're not doing everything they want you to do because you can't. And so that brings more shame and more guilt. But um, that, that a dialogue could start because the healing begins when we say it out loud to one person, just one person. And I always say, find someone that their life had been broken and God's put it back together. They won't talk. They'll know what you're going through. They've got something to tell you. But to say it out loud to somebody um, it starts, I mean, it will break its power by half. I'm telling you, it did with me. So powerful. I'm so excited that like you even sharing that to say it out loud, to share your secret. And I think both of you so much for just your open and your honesty and your transparency. And I'm so excited because we will have so much more with Russ and Tori. They're going to, we're going to dive deeper into even the trauma and just more about recovery and relapse and addiction. And I just really feel if you're watching this right now and you really connect with Russ and Tori's story, we have our prayer partners are available at 888-665-4483. We have prayer partners standing by that want to pray with you, that want to stand with you because just like Russ said, sometimes you have to say it out loud. Maybe there's a secret in you right now that you're battling addiction. Maybe you're that husband that's hiding the liquor, whatever it may be. Call us right now. We really want to connect with you. We are back with Russ and Tori Taft to dig deeper into their incredible testimony of overcoming addiction through faith and power and Christ's love. And I'm here with Pastor Jay. Yeah, it's so good to be here. Before I ask my first question to both of you, uh, my mama grew up listening to you <laughs> in a conversion van with me and my brother yeah. with a cassette tape called The Imperials. So yes. I know all about yeah. you. Oh, I yeah. mean, man, my mama went to glory in 2007, but uh. it's so good to uh, be with you guys. And uh, I love the interview you guys were talking about because you're talking about secret traumas. And I just felt in my heart that there's many people watching today that have secret traumas traumas and because they don't know how to deal with those traumas we turn to other things some people are even addicted to church we just yeah, try to make it from absolutely. sunday to sunday just to get through but the fact of the matter is that if we don't learn how to deal with those traumas we'll anesthetize it in some way so yes. what would you say to people that are dealing with hurts addictions strongholds how do i get through it i've been to the altar i've gone to jesus i keep going back what did you do differently besides that well um I, that, it had to be addressed because every time I'd start making strides, you know, and, and, and God moving in concerts and stuff like that, and then you fall back. Yeah. And you fall back, and then you start thinking. I, but it all started, the healing process started when I trusted somebody. Yeah. Saying, I can't do this by myself. It's too big. And I keep losing the battle, keep losing the battle. I mean, it could be food. It could be anything yeah, right. that we numb the pain. Uh, but for me, it started with trusting one person to say, I'm hurting, you know, and this is ripping my life apart. It's ripping me apart. Now, what steps can I take? And thank God, there, there, her brother is a therapist, and he began to kind of lay, lay it out, you know. Mm -hmm. Let church deal with this. Uh, find a therapist that can go back to those memories. Mm -hmm. And healing begins in there also. Mm -hmm. But it starts with trusting one person to say, I'm hurting, I'm hurting. Mm -hmm. And that's so powerful what you're talking about, healing those memories. It's like the traumas and the memories. And it's so important, especially with addiction, to go back to those places yeah. because it's not just somebody picks up a bottle no. or somebody yeah. takes the needle. It all mm -hmm. is, goes back to that tra some trauma. Yeah. And, and, and the trauma, I don't know what, what, we didn't use that term for a while. It was, I, we knew he had had a rough time coming up, but that term came in. Um, I didn't tell her the whole story of my childhood. Never. And I, wow. I knew the stories of some of them. What came out after he was specifically treated for trauma in an inpatient facility, he was gone 60. Five days. And it was very intensive. And what came out was that everything we already knew 
was a little more. I knew there was violence in the home. I didn't know there was almost daily violence in the home. And I want to say, his parents were not monsters. No, they did no. not wake up in the morning and say, what can I do to screw up my kids? Yeah. They were operating out of all the knowledge they had. They did not have access to what we have had access to. And it's easy to just hate them and put it on them and their monsters, but they weren't. They were damaged people who didn't get help. And they were they were trying to pray it away their whole yeah. life and didn't understand. Why, and I, we still don't know the extent of what happened to them, but what they we were know- silent about their childhood. It passed yeah. on to another generation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was broken in this generation. What's yeah. so exciting, uh, Jay, is, is that churches, are growing up, you know. So many churches, they have a therapist on, you know, uh, in part of the, the, the pastoral team. Yeah. And somebody that you can go to, uh, and it, uh, uh, you know, I could afford therapy where I would went and, and pay a therapist. But I mean, God's raising up a bunch of people in his body because of this, these problems and they need help that uh, they can reach out to, yeah. you know, and they have pastors like you that's very well versed uh, in addiction and marriage and, and you too, Sydney, you know, with addiction and marriage and all of this stuff that, that questions can be answered. Why do I keep doing the same thing over and yeah. over and over? Somebody that can sit across from, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Because I couldn't do it by myself. Yeah. I tried. We don't think a lot of churches, well, we, we love the crowds, but sometimes we don't like the people. You know, we like having a lot of people out there, but we don't want to get in in the stinky yeah, stuff. Absolutely. But I, I thank God that we serve a God that gets in the stinky stuff. Absolutely. You know, that yes, gets does. in there where the trauma is and what happened. We're so used to shouting over all of our problems. Yes. And you know, we come to church and we clap and the yeah. pastor preaches a great sermon, but nobody teaches me. I'm at home. My wife ticked me off. I just got a bad report on the job and I have no idea how to think. And I love what you guys are saying about the, the, the renewing of the mind. Yes. And so what happened in your therapy? I'm, I'm going to even speak to you. I, it, it affected you. How did you work through the, uh, the, not necessarily the abuse, but the trauma that he caused you because of the addiction? Yeah, no, there was never any physical abuse ever in our life. And also Russ was sober up to 10 years at a time. A relapse happened when a parent died, when his father died, when his brother died, there was tremendous survivor's guilt there. Um, but you don't, it's easy to be the, the healthy one by default when you're mm -hmm. married to someone who is addicted mm -hmm. because um, on my worst day, at least I wasn't doing that. So it's wow. easy to sort of sit back and, and I know. It's knew, like, you go get well, I'm going to sit exactly. here and wait on you. Or else that, she didn't send him that. a treatment and say, yeah. fix him and then send him back. Um, I knew enough to know that this is a family disease mm -hmm. and that it affects every member of the family, whether you are seeing it in, or not, as even when I wasn't seeing it. I became so, um, codependent is a trendy word, but it's very serious. Mm -hmm. I became so tuned in to every nuance of what was going on with him, that if he walked in a room, I could tell you if he was mad, if he was, but if you ask me, how are you feeling? What's going on with you? I wouldn't have a clue because all the focus was here and what's going to happen next. And you're living in a heightened sense of, of vigilance and awareness and it's not healthy. No. But it's, it started with me. It was suggested that I, I've got to start thinking about myself the way Jesus thinks about me. And I remember it was hard to read the Bible when I first sobered up because all I could hear was daddy's sermons and how negative and hard they were. But I started writing little things on my mirror and I would leave them there and I would say it to myself. Yeah, yeah. You know, I am the righteousness of God. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but, and it was constant. It mm -hmm. was constant. My voice hearing me say, I am the righteousness of God. I am forgiven and I'm free. But day after day yeah. after day and, and, and it took a while. But my mind started thinking that way. And, and I remember a friend saying, read the red of the Bible. If you're hearing all these sermons, just read the words of Jesus. And I saw Jesus. I didn't know. I saw this old line, you know, denominational God that didn't like me very much. But when you see Jesus, yes. him and the power of his words and, you know, the, the 17th chapter of John that he's praying for me. Amen. He's Amen. praying for me. Uh, but you have to change your whole mindset, but it takes a day after day after day. Well, you're, you know that, yeah. you know that. Not a doubt. 
well, you know, in the, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, um, you know, hearing your testimony, some people are listening to your story, how do you rebuild your marriage, your, your family, when you, something so traumatic happens like this? Um, I knew myself well enough to know that I was not going to say, God, I want to forgive him, so please let me forgive him. And then I'd open my eyes and, and feel the forgiveness. My prayer was, um, I don't feel forgiveness. I feel wariness. Uh, my will is to forgive and to be able to go on, but you're going to have to do the heavy lifting. And I can't fake it with you. And so I'm asking you to do that part. And so I could kind of let go of it and not feel like I should, I should, I should. I kept working on myself. He kept working on himself. And then we were working together. And little by little in increments, trust started coming back. Respect started coming back. And respect is the hardest one. Yeah, yeah. And little by little, when I saw him get up, do the work, it's not real glamorous and fun, and it's not all uh, insights and light bulbs going off. Therapy is hard yeah, work, yeah. and there's a lot of pain in it, but it's so important. And as we would work together and separately, I started inch by inch remembering that guy that I had so much fun with, that guy that yeah. we traveled the world together. That, that I'd guy. forgotten who I was. That because. guy we wrote songs together, the, that started coming back. And there was a part of me, and I think why I didn't leave is because I believed that guy was in there. I would yeah. fight him about it. I would mm -hmm. say, this is not who you are. This is not who you are. Mm -hmm. And he would look at me and go, yeah, it is. I'm a Taft. This is what Tafts do. Wow. And um, that's the part I didn't give up on. I knew that if we couldn't reach that, that I was going to have to leave. But thank God I didn't have to. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for coming and sharing your story. Russ Taff and Tori, I still believe, which they do, you can tell it by their <laughs> testimony here. And you're still in love, which is amazing yeah. as well. And listen, there's so much in your book. We don't have time to go into it. Our time is up. But you've got to get your hand on this book. It was one of the most provocative books I've ever read. It speaks to every area. It speaks to how it affects the addict as well as to those who have been affected by addiction. It's a conversation through the whole book that will completely bless you. They're going to join us at the end, and we're going to pray. And if you're battling with addiction, if you have a secret or something that's going on in your life, I want you to pick up the phone right now, 888-665-4483. We still believe, and God is a God that hears and answers yes. prayer. Call now, and God will bring a breakthrough Amen. into your life.